गुड इवनिंग आत्मा नमस्ते सुमी अमित नमस्ते होप ऑल ऑफ यू आर डूइंग वेल ग्रेट ओके सो लेट्स गो लाइव फर्स्ट बिफोर आई फॉरगेट यस सो वील स्टार्ट ऑफ विद आर इन्विकेशन काइंडली क्लोज यूर आईज connect tongue to your palate inhale and exhale relax the body as you exhale release all stress tension worries you want to calm your mind so we may be better instruments to absorb all these teachings on a deeper clearer level to the supreme being the divine father divine mother to our beloved and respected teacher grand master chok kok sri to lord maha guru ji mele to all the great ones to all the holy masters holy gurus healing ministers healing angels especially to the beings of knowledge light and power we humbly ask for the blessings of all the great teachers and the masters of theosophy we ask for the help of the angels and beings of communication and our respective wifi to our soul and divine self we ask for your divine light knowledge understanding clarity all through this session to help us have a deeper understanding of the priceless teachings given to us we especially thank grand master chur for the foundation in spirituality that helps us get a good grasp on these amazing teachings we ask you to help us to absorb and assimilate this and use it to become better instruments and channels for god to use we offer ourselves as instruments in your service with thanks and in full faith so be it inhale the blessings exhale allow to spread your entire being inhale and exhale inhale and exhale slowly open your eyes with a smile atma namaste atma namaste guys welcome to chapter 13 interesting today is friday as well <laughs> so you have a <laughs> interesting number there anyways so um to continue with where i think you all stopped last time the chapter that we're going to look at is kundalini right and uh, so keeping kundalini in mind <laughs> yes all love and namaste to everyone thank you before that yeah i was talking to them yesterday about uh, the last day before? day before yesterday about discharge and i was telling them how uh, you can use the power of sound and mantras also to discharge or accelerate the expelling of disease energy and input of fresh energy uh, so you remember you were in uh, leela and you were chanting om namah shivaya with uh, master chor yeah you tell or no <laughs> <laughs> maybe not then <laughs> so um so one of the things that uh, master chor mentions is when there's a lot of um let's say that your aura is clouded and uh, there's a lot of inner noise that clouds you from taking proper decisions from feeling um and sometimes your feelings also cloud your judgment and this starts becoming a problem not just with uh, relationships at home but also starts to affect relationships at work and your performance and so um one of the things that uh, also happens is this is partially got to do with your own thought forms that you create but also sometimes thought forms of, from others so if you are not performing well for example or you're going through a, a, a difficult time maybe health wise then even thought forms of others in the house in the office space is oh you know poor thing you know what she what she going through or what is he going through yeah you know this happened to him so even the thoughts that come to you are not something that encourages you and helps you heal but rather pulls you down and so these energies can really affect you so master chor mentioned that if you want to overcome them one of the ways that you do it is uh, you do not visualize yourself for example we are in this room you visualize yourself out on the beach yes uh, seated in front of the sea with your palms upwards uh, being aware of what you want to to remove from your system now before that we usually scan the energy that is not conducive for our health and then you do an invocation specifically for that whatever it is that you want to remove you you become aware of that 
and then you're aware of your agnya and your basic while you chant. So the chant uh, is first Om Mani Padme Hum. Yes, so that's one of the ways in which you can try and remove or uh, cleanse yourself of this impurity that's, that's bothering you and affecting you. And so you do one chant aloud, one chant silently. Now silently is still mouth movement. So if it's uh, loudly Om Mani Padme Hum, the second one will be Om. Yes, you have to mouth it. And so you do that. So in multiples of nine, uh, so depending on how strong it is, yes, this impurity within us, it might take a 27, it might take more than that. And as it starts to reduce, it kind of literally shrinks, right? And then you still continue. And after that, you have to ask for blessings. What is it that you want in return? So just like you do the, the uh, principle of sacrifice and blessing. So you sacrifice these impurities to God uh, through uh, the blessings of Buddha Kwani and through Om Mani Padme Hum or through Lord Shiva with Om, uh, Om Namah Shivaya. Now, Om Namah Shivaya is not to be used as frequently until and unless Om Mani Padme Hum is not working for you. So don't use that first. And that's why when he asked me, I was looking at him. So use Om Mani Padme Hum. Uh, um, you can use it on a regular basis. Om Namah Shivaya is only when it really does. For the powerful. Uh, it's, it's when it's still not you know, effective and you still need to disintegrate it then uh, it's a good thing to start to use. Yeah. We haven't started Kundalini. Thank Just you. Sir. We start with power. Kundalini is power. Lord Shiva is power. What do you keep doing? I, I don't know. It keeps <laughs> happening. It happened so many times that time. Did you spotlight? Yes. I was so distraught that uh, I wasn't with her yesterday. I didn't even spotlight it myself. My it day for yesterday. Yes. <laughs> See, I lost track of time and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I didn't deserve a spotlight without you, so I didn't put it. See? See? <laughs> I'm sorry, you have to listen to this. <laughs> and I have to listen to this <laughs> in front of all of you. <laughs> all right, chapter 13. <laughs> Let's go. So, Kundalini, something that, uh, thanks to Master Chua, we've all heard about, uh, we understand to a larger degree. So, when you read through this, uh, it's going to start making a lot of sense. If you have already read it, <laughs> Um, God bless you too, Nadia. So here we go. So it starts off with the names that are given to this particular energy. It's called the Serpent Fire. Uh, it's called the Serpent Fire. And uh, it's also called Fiery Power. And it's also called World's Mother. Yeah. Now, this particular energy that we're talking about, like we knew in the first chapter, is one of those uh, three forces that come from the sun. Right, and the other being Fohat and Prana, and they say it cannot be, uh, you know, interchanged. So coming back to this energy, clairvoyantly they say that this energy looks like liquid fire. So basically, the color being, you know, obviously red, and there must be a certain amount of orange. So it just said it looks like liquid fire, and uh, it then rushes through the body. Interestingly, it doesn't say that it goes only upwards or, you know, sideways. It says it it rushes through the body. And uh, it continues to say that when it moves, it moves in a spiral, uh, spiraled manner, which looks like a coiled serpent. And so one of the ways in which it is represented is also a coiled serpent. Another representation of this, which is not mentioned here, is also the dragon, right? The dragon that spits out or blows fire out of its mouth is another representation of the Kundalini. And so you'll find that in many of the religions, there is this uh, depiction. Yes, uh, so you find, for example, uh, Buddha Kwan Yin. She's standing on a dragon. Sometimes it's just a single-headed uh, dragon. Sometimes it's seven-headed, right? For example, the one that I have here actually has uh, seven. You know, the one there. <laughs> so it has uh, seven heads for the dragon. The same thing if you go to a church and you look at uh, the image of Mother Mary, you'll find again her foot is on a snake. Right again, representing the Kundalini. What does it actually mean? Uh, it's got to do with also the symbol in the Hinduism book where Lord Krishna is standing over. Uh, you remember the snake, right? He's standing uh, with his flute on top of the snake's head, which means that this great deity, whether it's Buddha Kwanian, whether it's Lord Krishna or Mother Mary, has full control and mass, uh, full control over the Kundalini. And so they are able to control the movement of the Kundalini and how it has to move, not causing any 
trouble for them. And now depending on the number of, uh, if it's represented by a snake, the number of uh, hoods of the snake, if it's a dragon, the number of head represents the number of layers that have been fully activated by that great being, yeah? So coming back, so they say that it looks like a coiled serpent and the name of world's mother is appropriate because uh, through it, our various vehicles may be vivified, which means it gives it consciousness and form uh, that is alive, right? To, so simply to be alive, uh, it also means that the Kundalini has to be awakened. So when you're spiritually dead, your Kundalini is not awakened. It takes time for this spiritual being to awaken the Kundalini and that's the process that we're gonna to go to in a bit. Mm -hmm. Yes, it needs to fully come up uh, and uh, we look at that. Do you wanna say something now? Yeah, let me take an open presentation. Um, so, um, Kundalini, you know what? I got a really good input on um, this forehead prana and electricity, uh, forehead prana and kundalini, and why it cannot be converted from one to another. And it says, so far as is known, so so far as they know, it cannot be converted. And then I got a really good insight, and I didn't write it down. <laughs> Sorry. So I've been trying to figure it out. Bye. Anyway, I got it. I got it in the morning or yesterday or something. Anyway, it's gone. Yeah, he does this also. Sorry. So. Um, okay, so, so far it's known. Uh, now, Kundalini has been basically called the world's mother. Now, the world's mother is repeated like twice. twice and um, the truth is called uh, liquid fire rushes through the body. It sounds all cool and moving in spiral. Again, spiral again. Remember from the spirali and everything like that. Uh, and the world's mother is appropriate. If you meditate on the uh, name of uh, what it means to be a mother, one way to look at it is, uh, uh, on the lines of what Sumi was saying, is that the mother uh, is the one that nourishes. And it is through the mother that the child is empowered, uh, provided with the necessary nutrients to grow. Right? Without, say, the milk of the mother, of course, now you have formula. Uh, <laughs> but without mother's milk, generally it is very difficult for uh, babies to grow uh, you know, very, very fast. And without the mother's, uh, that is physical. Now, without on the emotion level, without the mother's uh, care and emotion and love, uh, the child will not grow. And on the mental level again, and uh, also on the spiritual level. Now, uh, because the way the mother feels almost molds the baby when they're also on the womb. So it starts from a very, very, it's, I'm not talking about after birth necessarily. It's, you can even start it from, uh, from when the conception. conception. But on another level, the Kundalini energy, the word is world's mother. World's mother is different uh, because when you say world's mother, it means that um, it is through the Kundalini energy that matter is formed. It is through the Kundalini energy that anything has a form. Without Kundalini energy, you can have no form. You cannot have a physical body. You cannot have anything. You see, the mother is the one that provides the form of the baby. Even physically speaking, it provides the form and it provides the place. So without the mother, the, the, the higher soul cannot extend a portion of itself downward. There is nowhere to go. Okay, so the mother is the one that provides form and that form is linked to Kundalini energy. More than that, it's an open session, but for any matter to exist, it requires a certain amount of Kundalini energy. Okay, so I'll just show you a couple of quotes. Sure. One second. Um, yeah, one second, let me just check this too. It's, uh, So, Tian means God, Chi means energy, all right? Um, the basic is, the Kundalini Chi is the energy that is responsible for the manifestation of matter. So that's why it's called the world's mother. Without it, the physical body, as well as the physical universe, cannot exist. So you're not looking only at ourselves. You have to understand as above, so below, and they will, uh, they will um, hint this at the end of this chapter, okay? Without it, not only, so there are many levels of Kundalini, 
all right? And without this Kundalini energy, you cannot have a form, okay? And although Kundalini energy is concentrated near the base of spine, its presence is everywhere, all right? For example, water is found in a lake, but it's pervasive because it exists in the air as water vapor. Now you have to, uh, more than this, I cannot give you a hint, okay? If you cannot figure this out, then yes, it's not a study session, right? Um, so that's why it's known as the world's mother. And if you notice at the last uh, line of the paragraph, it says, through it are various vehicles are vivified, maybe vivified. You're not talking about physical, because most times people say, ah, yeah, it's a to-do, upgrading the brain, upgrading the physical body. That is okay. But not only the, that's not the only vehicle you have. You have to upgrade the emotional body. You have to register other, uh, you know, you're a being of light, love, and power. So you need to upgrade all three vehicles to register subtle frequency. So one, one vehicle is not enough. Physical body and etheric body is not enough. You need the emotional aspect. You need the mental aspect. So various vehicles are uh, awakened using Kundalini energy. And we'll go into how and we'll explain why it's important. All right. Um, so to continue, now when you talk about Kundalini, right, uh, you've got to understand when a woman is pregnant, her Kundalini is automatically getting awakened, right? And so, uh, especially in our Hatha Yoga, we recommend, Basajo recommends that we, that she does not do her Kundalini meditation at that point. Right. And so this is one of the reasons because it's automatically getting awakened. You do not want to force it. You do not want to uh, push it. You know, it should go on its own pace. So moving on, um, the Kundalini, therefore, is there in all vehicles, not just in our vehicles, but also in the different planes. Right. So the Kundalini doesn't exist only in with reference to our physical form but uh, not just in the human form, like we put it that way. It's also in the animal kingdom. It's also in the plant kingdom. It's in all the various planes as well. Yes. Uh, and uh, on seven layer, seven levels, in the seven levels, in seven layers. So to move on, the symbol of the Kundalini. So let's look at that very quickly. So in ancient, uh, the ancient symbol is the spinal column and Kundalini is that of the uh, thyrsus. Yes. So, if you look at this particular symbol, it looks like a, a, a spear, right? Or it looks like a huge uh, pipe or, or, or a rod, and it has a cone on top, right? Uh, so literally the cone that you find in the forest, it looks like the cone on top. So that symbolizes again for us the Kundalini. Now, interestingly, they don't talk about the cone. They just talk about it all around, but they don't explain what it is. But you and I know what that cone means. Right? Especially if you've done the soul course or if you've done uh, the Arhatic Yoga course, you, you know what that cone means. Now, interestingly, they say, but in the Indian tradition, it's supposed to be a stick of bamboo with seven knots. Right? The seven knots representing the, the old uh, seven chakra system uh, in India. Now, prob probably uh, this is also associated with Lord Shiva. Yes. And so if you look at the Trishul that he has, uh, it has three right? Like that coming out and, the, and there's a huge rod. But on, on the top of the middle one, usually they put a lemon. Okay, so equivalent to what we would call uh, the thyrsus uh, that was held by, I think, Bacchus or something like that, B-A-C-C-H-U-S or something. That's the man who used to hold that one. And so it is represented by uh, even in the Indian tradition, for me, basically what Master Chaur talks about, the Trishul by Lord Shiva. Now, you will find uh, that the same thing also exists when you look at what the uh, medical fraternity today use, which is uh, the Kadishis. Yes, the same symbol, which is used by the medical fraternity. Now, here they talk about this uh, barber pole, which is not common in India. And I had no idea what this barber pole is. Of course, for them, in those days, a hundred years ago, it was a very modern uh, version. But if you look at it, it, it basically looked like, like a candy, uh, green, white, and blue. It's, it's spiraling. And then it has on top like a cone again. Yeah. Uh, so again, representing this, it's supposed to be an ancient symbol uh, that they use. Now, I don't know why the barber is using it. Maybe because he's working with the head region. But anyway, that's uh, the like same. Yeah, it comes. It's an ancient symbol. That's what they say. Right, and so these are all symbols of basically the system through which the spiral, yes, the, the Kundalini goes through that spiraling effect all the way up. 
and reaches the cone, which you and I know is not just a cone, but it is the root of, uh, let me say, the crown center for now, right? And so uh, coming back to what I'm saying, the Kundalini exists in the next paragraph in all planes, and uh, this appears also in seven layers. And so if you look at it, there are seven layers, and each layer has seven sub-layers. And so there are actually 49 layers of awakening the Kundalini. So we need to remember that uh, as we continue. Yeah? Okay. You want to say anything or shall I move? It's just... Uh... You want me to put the picture? Yeah, I thought you would. But yeah, I was going to. That. You didn't <laughs> mention. Uh... I already finished. Mm. Anyway, you can talk about it. Well, I have nothing to talk about. It's just a pole. <laughs> yeah. And the pine That's cone. A... That's supposed to be what a pineal or pineal gland looks like. And of course, the staff is the Shushumna, uh, Shushumna Nadi. Or the central meridian. Central meridian. And it is steel. Where is it say steel? Steel? This says say rod. Rod. Hollow iron rod. Yeah. Iron rod in one. And just um, one. When after the fifth layer of the Kundalini is awakened, when it goes up, it actually almost feels like steel or iron going up. It's very slow and very dense, very hard. And your body better be strong at that point. Otherwise, you're going to be in big trouble. Maybe we'll talk about it at the end of the chapter. Yeah. Okay. And um, It's like molten lava going up your No, spine. molten lava is maybe second. No, it's Third, yeah. Fifth is. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, so, okay, let me just. Um, okay, um, oh, it's gone off. No, it's there. What's this? Okay, anyway. Can just... All right, so, so that's what Sumi was talking about. The Kundalini exists on pl all planes. Now, there are seven planes, and then, uh, which we know, uh, anything, it appears to have seven layers or degrees of flow. So, seven to seven is uh, 49. So, people say, ah, I want to awaken my Kundalini, right? Now, that is why it's very important to understand that it's not physical. It's physical, etheric, emotional, mental all through you have to awaken. That's why you have these layers. And in each plane, there are seven sub layers. Are you getting it now? <laughs> okay. So, um, so people say, I want to awaken my Kundalini. That's okay. But you see, everybody's Kundalini is already partially awakened. So it's not a matter of whether it's awakened or not. It's a matter of how awakened it is. All right. Everybody has intelligence. It's not a matter of intelligent or not intelligent. It's a matter of how intelligent you are, right? So everybody can think <laughs> to a certain extent only. All right. So it's the same. But the question is, how accurately can you, how accurately can you think and how clearly can you think? All right. But so, so, um, so, so uh, the same thing with Kundalini energy. It's not a matter of how awakened it is, but the matter of degree of awakening. All right. Yeah, that's what Master you do. So that's why you have, of yeah. So that's why there are seven layers of awakening. Have you seen a tree? You know, like a not it's a cut. of course you've seen a tree, but when it's cut, um, when you look at the tree, you see these rings. So if you look clairvoyantly, based on what I understand, when Master was talking to us, uh, you look, it, it has these rings, right? So the Kundalini is something like that; it's coiled, all right. So these seven, uh, uh, there are seven layers, seven coils, and inside, if you if you can zoom in, so in Kundal, you know, uh, with clairvoyance, you can zoom in and zoom out with intention. It's like your uh, pinch and zoom on your phone. Okay, with intention. So when you want to go through to a different frequency and you see the lower sub layers, there are seven inside each, each layer. Each layer. Okay? So imagine a rope and inside the rope you open, there are seven smaller ropes. And each rope is one plane. All right. Um, so that's seven to seven, that's 49. All right. So sometimes you will see a cobra that is round. Uh, it's not going up. It's just like a round coil thing. All right. That means, according to Master Chua, the person is possessed by its animalistic nature. Okay, uh, or um, that is the first choice. The second choice is that. Um, wait, what did I say? Anyway, so when when that happens, when uh, animalistic nature means uh, we've not reached that part, right? 
you'll reach that part when they even when it's mostly the person's animalistic so what does animals do they eat they mate they poop and they die <laughs> right so okay. that's basically so it's lower lower region okay now as the energy goes up all right, it means you're able to bring the lower energy up. When you do that, the upper chakras get highly, highly activated. The higher principle of the person, they're activated and then they control your lower nature. All right. So when the serpent fire is awakened to a high, high degree um, in India, since it's symbolized by cobras, like uh, Sumi said, uh, it, 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 it shows them as cobras. All right. Now, these people, I think they're called Nagas or initiates yeah. or something. So in the Christian tradition, also, uh, Lord Jesus, he says, um, be wise as that of a serpent. Uh, so when he says serpent, he says and has Hamlet as a lamb, right? But so when he says the word serpent, he's not talking about physical serpent because he, to be wise as a serpent doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, he's, talking, he, he's talking about the initiate. He's talking about the teachers. Why they call serpents? Because according to Master Cho, when we ask him, he says because the Kundalini energy has been highly awakened, okay? Ordinary people, when you look at them, it's only the first degree is awakened, first sub-layer or something like that, first degree of Kundalini awakening, right? Partially awakened, right? Now, um, by the way, as the Kundalini keeps coming up and down, all right, goes in and out, uh, awakens, it has an activating effect on the chakras. And what happens is uh, sometimes it might happen after your meditation, a few hours later, so you might have dreams of uh, snakes, like you're sleeping and you say, oh, there are snakes all over on the floor. And you, you might get scared, but don't worry, that's just Kundalini awakening. If it's um, small snakes, like many of them, it's uh, to do with sub layers. Uh, if it's one big snake coming at you, that is a big or, or a complete major layer being sub -layer. awakened. Sub -layer. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, one of the reasons why this happens is uh, the the higher soul, when it's trying to give you uh, an understanding, usually tries to give you messages and symbols, in symbols that you and I can recognize, right? So uh, sometimes even though the symbol comes, it's not something you're used to. Like for example, uh, a person in America has no clue that the Kundalini is represented by a snake. And when they say snakes, they're going to get scared. Now, if they have to go to a Freudian psychologist, they'll convert it into something completely different. So, <laughs> but if you are spiritual and you understand what it means, thanks to Master Chur, uh, even if you're not from, say, an Indian background or even a Hindu background, you will still understand it because these spiritual teacher, teachings are now given out to the public. And so the snake is one way of representing the awakening of the Kundalini. So whether you see uh, movies with it, whether you see stories with it, you know, especially in, in, in the old Indian tradition in Sanskrit, you have them. But if you go to China and, and to the other places, you'll find that the teachings have got to do with the dragon, right? So the dragon is the one they, they use as, as a symbol, not really a snake. So different places have placed this differently. Uh, so it's for us to remember all the commonalities. So when we move, travel uh, and read, we are able to understand it better. So we'll find out that this uh, symbol is, um, it's a symbol of power also because we'll talk about it. It generates a lot of tremendous power. So if you remember the Mortal Kombat uh, logo, <laughs> Mortal Kombat, you know, it's a dragon inside with a circle. Is that a circle, snake? Okay, fine. No, dragon, it's Chinese. <laughs> okay, it was Chinese, yes, that movie. Uh, so yes, when you see a huge snake chasing you, it's, it's again got to do with a, the, a full sub-layer, that is, seven, sorry, a full layer. Which when is when you're seven, dreaming, not in real life. Yeah, in real life, it, you better it, it, Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> in real life, uh, it's not yeah, a Yeah, so whenever you go to the forest or sometimes in the ashram, uh, oh, please my don't kundalini tell my got kundalini. Away. <laughs> And that's not a physical representation of your activated <laughs> kundalini also, yeah? Okay, so this is in your dreams. If it is, it's, uh, if it's a big one like uh, Amit mentioned, it's all seven sub-layers. No, 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 one meter, one, sir. one meter. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were saying all the pages. I like that. No, no, no. <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, all seven sub-layers of one full layer is awakened, which means that's why it looks thick and big, which, is mean, which means all of them. Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> Uh, the uh, I think there's a lot more in Kung Fu there's Panda. There's a lot more. Master would have really liked that. Yeah, he would have loved the movie, and I can imagine pausing and explaining to us. <laughs> and like, Master, can we just watch the movie? He's like, okay, now you know what's happening. This is what's happening. Yeah, but then he make you forward the bits. Yes, later on. and if he doesn't like it, he forwards the whole part, and then he will have to sit and wait till he gets to a point where he pauses it. 
So we watched a lot of movie. What was that? Uh, Crouching Tiger. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It's what I saw with Master Chua at some nine o'clock of the night. We were all so excited we were going to watch a movie. And then most of it was fast forward. Only the parts that he found was interesting. He'll stop, explain, and he'll like, -da -da -da. like, okay, we saw the movie in one hour or less. Anyway, go ahead. Huh? Is you, it me or you? Yeah, you. Oh, Astral me. body. All right. So now let's move to the astral body. So they're basically talking about our astral body literally being just a chunk, right? A chunk of mass uh, that doesn't have any uh, much. Uh, the consciousness is so low that it really doesn't do much. And so for this body also to be utilized effectively, the Kundalini has to be risen in that astral body of ours. And so again, just like we talk about in the physical uh, body, we say it's somewhere close to the base of the spine. In a similar area is the Kundalini for the astral body. And so it has to start again from that point, going upwards. Uh, they say the navel is the next one. Uh, so for us, okay, moving upwards, the navel chakra, then they say from there it moves uh, towards the spleen. And then it goes to the heart, throat, uh, the Agni chakra, and up to the crown. That's the that's the movement of this particular Kundalini. And of course, as it moves, it awakens the corresponding uh, power within it. Yes, uh, whether it's clairvoyance or clairaudience, whatever it is, uh, that was described in the previous chapter. So the point is for us to realize that there is a route that this particular Kundalini has to take. Yes, and so it has to start on the base of the spine and the ultimate destination is the crown, right? So it has to go all the way up. Now, the mechanism by, by means of which we become aware of this astral happening, uh, they say that is grasped differently by different students. Um, now, they say that in our physical body, we have organs like the ears to hear, the eyes to see, and, uh, and other such important organs. However, they say that the arrangement in the astral body, just for us to understand, to grasp this uh, for us, is that in the astral body, the specialized organs not being necessary for the attainment of the result aimed at. Now, I didn't understand why that was, but anyway. So the point is, you and I have certain organs that are essential for us to be able to hear and see, for example, but in the astral body, it's not the same. Just like in the astral body, we said that the Kundalini is somewhere there, but remember the astral body doesn't work like us, uh, three-dimensional, it's probably four-dimensional. And so we cannot really fathom how that actually is or moves. And uh, so coming back, so it says the we need to understand that the astral happening is interesting and we need to have a clear, clear understanding. And so what does it say? It says uh, that in the astral body, the arrangement is different. So entirely different arrangement is made in the astral body. Specialized organs, right? Not being necessary for the attainment of the result in depth. Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay, so go ahead and explain that. Well, that part I didn't get. What is this? So... Should I explain from here or should I just explain that part and you can no, no, continue? No, you can continue and finish here, then I'll go to the other. Okay. Uh, the astral body is almost an inert mass, blah, blah, blah. And no clear knowledge of the world surrounds it. Basically, it means that there is very little, the person is not capable of. So it's, it's giving you more and more hints that Kundalini has to do with power. Okay, with with the will, and he's going to talk about it directly later on. Um, and I think he's also talking about life because without it, it's just like when blah. yeah. So there's uh, basically not much emotional effort. All right. Um, have you seen people like um, ordinary people who are not regularly practicing or awakening their kundalini? All right, uh, and are not that developed, which there's nothing wrong with. We're all at different levels of development. Um, you notice when you go and tell them to do something, uh, the moment you don't look at them, the moment you don't follow up with something, or you know you you change, um, you know you change something. Uh, like for example, you tell okay so and so okay why don't you do this do this do this do this and you leave it to them. And then if you don't follow up, and the moment you look away or you turn to another matter, and then you come back and say is it done? They don't do it. <laughs> Have you noticed that? You have to constantly be after them. Did you do it? Please do it. Reminder, reminder, please do it. If they know you're watching, they will, they will, they will go ahead. They need that push. They don't have that emotional drive, the emotional effort to move, right? That to get that emotional effort, you need Kundalini energy to awaken a certain centers within you. Okay. Or certain aspects within you. 
So looks that is, like the Kundalini just took an interesting turn in Delhi. I think they had an earthquake there. Really? Hope all of you are okay. Uh, and it wasn't really bad. Mm. Yeah, Gauri. And all of you in Delhi out there. Go ahead. Yeah. So now if you look at the other people, some people, they just have this natural charisma. When you look at them, actually you want to work for them. Right? And they, by looking at them, like, what do you want me to do? I'll do that. <laughs> and then using their energy or some, some way, when they tell you, it's like an empowerment. You, you use that energy to move. So that is a sign that, of course, that person's Kundalini is more awakened. Okay? So, so that's what it means for, um, you know, not doing anything. I think this is also the reason when uh, a great teacher comes into town or even their senior disciples come, you want to hear from them or you want them to give a talk because you're hoping that through that talk or that, uh, you know, nurturing session, if you can call it, someone else gets inspired to then, you know, follow the path of spirituality or whatever it is that you want them, prani healing or hati yoga. Yeah. And if you look at it, Kundalini was then awakened. That's what I think was the first time they're using that word or one of the first few times they use the word. When you use the word awakened, that means the power is already there inside. Now that technology is, uh, is a little strange. So it's like a potential energy, right? You know, it's like water uh, that's behind a dam. What's hitting the wall is potential energy. If you remove the wall, it'll just blast out. So like, for example, you have a spring, you know, and it's spirally. So that's a good example. You put the spring all the way down and it's coiled and it's compressed, that is potential energy packed into that spring. So to, when you awaken it, the power is released. All right, so that, that's giving you a hint that Kundalini energy, it's not kinetic energy, it's nothing like that, it's a potential energy, all right? Just to be nerdy about it. Um, now, um, it's moved to second center near the yeah. navel and vivify, thereby awakening the astral, uh, okay. Now this is one way, they're, they're giving a hint to awaken it, but we know that you need the divine energy to awaken it. Um, and the Taoists, they use another way to awaken it. They start at the navel. So it's not always at the basal spine. Basal spine technique is it's quite, uh, quite old. Um, so there are different And may not be the safest. Definitely not the safest. So what they do is they say a mantra, they start at the basic, then they go to the navel and they chant. And that's, that's not, that, that really, um, anyway, we'll talk about it as it moves forward. Now, what is this you wanted to talk about? Although in the physical body, we have special. So we'll just look at this first, if I have anything to say on this. So here, the book in, in Master Chua is saying, it's not only physical, you need Kundalini energy to uh, for emotional, mental, and even spiritual development of human beings. It is necessary for the f evolution of the human soul as well as the human body. So all the way from the grossest to the most subtlest, it's, it, it, it's, it's uh, permeating. So uh, I'm, anyway, there are a lot of hints. Huh? Um, anyway, so the quality of the brain and nervous system depends on the awakening of the Kundalini and the ascent to the head area. And without the awakening of the Kundalini energy, spiritual development is not possible. And why is it not possible? Um, we will look at it. We will look at it maybe later. <laughs> okay. Um, now, what the, I'll just skip to the end. Uh, although in each physical body, we have uh, special organs, each located in a definite part. So mm -hmm. obviously, you know, um, in the physical body, you have physical organs. You know, you have special organs. For seeing, you have the eyes, you have the ear, and they're all located in specific part. You don't have the ear on your backside. You don't have your eyes on your uh, forehead. You might, or where do you, where do you put it? Where do you want to put that? On your nose. On my nose. On the nose. My two eyes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, so you don't. Also, I'd like to add there. It doesn't float around, right? So it's not like you have your eyes here today and tomorrow morning it kind of moves somewhere else. It's it's stationary. It doesn't really move. Okay, so that is the physical body. If you want to see, you need to use this uh, organ here and you can only use that to see. But if you're looking at the astral body, the arrangement is entirely different yeah. from that of the physical eye and the physical ear and the, all that stuff. Um, it, the, you don't need a specialized organ like a ear. You don't have an astral ear to hear. Oh, God. You don't have an astral eye to see. 
the arrangement is different. Um, it's not necessary. And they will continue and tell you why it's not necessary. Okay, now I got that. Understood. So uh, moving on to the next paragraph. The matter of the astral body is in a condition of constant movement. Right. And so for me, that's why I explained that in the physical body, things are not moving around. Right. It's, it stays in, in one particular space. However, uh, in the astral body, particles itself are flowing, swirling. And uh, it's very similar to what you see. Uh, remember the experiment in school when you boiled water. Right. And you and you realize that the molecules are moving all over. Something like that is how particles move in the astral body. And they pass through practically all the energy centers. Right. And so one particle doesn't flow only in a certain way and stay there. Here they're moving all over the place. And depending on what that center requires, they then absorb that into themselves. All right. So only a certain set of vibrations that are required by that center are then taken on. And so they talk about it. They say in, in our world, we talk about vibrations like light, sound, heat, so forth. So if that particular energy center requires light, only that vibration of light is taken it by that and then the next one might take the heat vibration so that particle moves all around giving the whole body just like we have uh, for example a spleen chakra supplying it to the whole body with the etheric body in the astral body all particles continue to give uh, each uh, energy center or each chakra the required vibration the astral centers are then vivified by this this movement that continues to happen now i think the particles are not just uh, atoms that we were talking about, I somehow feel that the Kundalini is also related to this, right? Because it then vivifies and literally awakens all of these centers, making them good to work, you know, in good working condition. And, uh, and then various powers with relation to certain centers, which we spoke about in earlier chapters, also start getting awakened. So uh, keeping this in mind, consequently, a man functioning we're talking about the, the, the incarnated soul functioning only in the astral body is then able to see not just with what you and I would call the physical eyes, but is able to see by the entire front of the astral body. He can see through the sides of his astral body and the back of his astral body. It's not that he has eyes all around, but literally just like you can feel the sense of touch is everywhere in the body. Similarly, sight in the astral body is all around. So you can see above through the crown of your head. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just say feet <laughs> for below, to see down below, right? And then through the sides, the front and the back. So literally you can see all around 360 degrees uh, with reference to sight. The same thing, I mean, with hearing also the same. And so all these faculties that you have in the astral body start getting awakened to a high, high degree. So whether it's the ability to smell, you don't smell only with one organ. And so that's why I didn't understand what was meant. But when Amit mentioned that, it's clear that it, they don't have a specific organ called a nose. They can smell through every part, right? And so I was just telling Amit, I said, you know, when Master Cho would be walking in front and if you're mischievous behind or you're saying things, you don't realize he can not only see what you're doing behind <laughs> I told you you could see. I told you. You didn't listen to me. Yeah, I didn't listen. I was too excited playing pranks. But anyway, and, and then you realize not only is that, but he can also hear what you said. So, you know, if you're joking behind, because sometimes we have all these jokes and we crack up. Uh, when we go for dinner, uh, we would all sit, uh, you know, we, we were the youngsters. I think we're still the youngsters because even when we gather now, we're still the youngest in the group. And we used to crack up, you know, and laugh. And Master Cho would be sitting at the other table there with a lot more people and what you call the senior, the older ones. And then after some time, he leave that table coming to us to listen to what our jokes are. So he said, okay, so what are you laughing about? And so we had to share Master Lee's with the jokes. He loved jokes. So. Huh? Go on. I think I had to stop there. No, you can continue. Till all the way till the last. Is it, um, all the way to the end? No, of that till, page? but even till, till here. Ah, okay, fine. All right. It's so let same, me just add. Same, so I'm just uh, talking about the eyes that could, you know, you can see through every part of the astral body. Uh, the chakram or center or the fourth center, therefore, cannot be described as organs of sense. Uh, the sense in the ordinary sense that you and I know, right? With sight, which is the eyes, but all over. Though they do convey the power of sense uh, to the astral body, right? And uh, so that's one of the amazing things about the astral body. Uh, shall I just finish the next paragraph, which is connected to that? No, because then it continues to, uh, it, then it continues to adopt no, method of awakening. 
No, the consciousness, which is in the astral experience. Shall I just finish that? Not yet, because okay, then go you're ahead, going to go ahead, it, right? okay, go I have nothing to say. <laughs> so let me continue. No, but I had to say that, right? I have nothing to say. You know why? <laughs> because I've actually spoken about this in the previous chapter. Remember? Yes, he has. I told He's you, saying... it goes there, it goes there. So everything, you can see from up, down, right, left. So you did say that. After you I use the remember. toilet, you don't need to look down and check anything. You just know what's happening. Um, okay. Are you going to talk now? No, no. When you say respond to a set of vibration, uh, you can change that to frequency. It's easier to understand. Okay. Uh, by the way, this is how telepathy works also. Okay, that's the concept behind telepathy. So, yeah, you can go ahead. <laughs> I never know whether he's going to say something. All right, let's go. You want to talk about that? Uh, later. Okay. Okay, let me just finish this. When you're talking, you can do that. We have about 12 odd minutes. Then we have questions. So then moving on. So it says, uh, but even when all the astral senses are awakened, which means the Kundalini has risen to the highest level all the way to the crown in the astral uh, body, it's not necessary that you on the physical level are conscious of it. Which means obviously that communication is not, you remember from the astral it goes through and through the nervous system comes, yeah. So that is not fully uh, functional. So what they say is uh, the, the, the need for us on the physical level then to awaken our Kundalini is very, very important, right? So not only on the astral level should it be awakened and then you have this amazing powers, but uh, when, when you come back to the physical form, we need to have it. So it says, the only way in which the consciousness of this astral experience can be brought into the physical brain is by the means of the corresponding etheric centers that has to be awakened. And so again, the same form that we spoke about with the astral, you have to start awakening the Kundalini, which lies somewhere around the base of the spine, awakening it from that base area all the way up. Yes, so the movement has to be very similar to it. And in this, uh, they say that uh, arousing the Kundalini, which lies dormant in the etheric matter in the center near the base of the spine. Yeah, somewhere. Again, there. dormant. Huh? Yeah, dormant. It's not awakened. So it really does need to be awakened. And so whatever you awaken in one lifetime, right, is, is what coming, you... We'll be uh, there later. About okay. The lifetime. Okay, go ahead. Um, what? So here, um, it's very interesting. It says, uh, but when astral senses are fully awake, uh, by no means the follows, okay, whatever it says. Uh, so it will not be able to bring through into the physical body any consciousness of the action. In other words, your brain will not be able to register what your astral body is seeing. <laughs> All right? So anyway, so here, basically, we're looking at two... Um, very important functions or um, reasons that we need to awaken the Kundalini energy, all right? And there might be more. The first reason we want to awaken the Kundalini energy is so that we awaken certain latent powers um, within us, right? And to enhance the senses, right? So you become like Superman, you know? You can see, I, I don't think you can see more, dis you can, right? Yeah. You can even see through the etheric body of the earth. Or something like that. Anyway, why should I say that? I so, don't know. yeah, because anyway, the, so anyway, you can see, uh, you know, the, the more your range is, the more you can see. That's why you've heard, I think uh, uh, Larry Masia, something was happening. He was close to this British guy. I, I, I'm very, I'm not very, um, uh, I, I'm not familiar with the um, story. story. Something about this British guy um, and, uh, he could sense that something was happening in the UK. There was a, there was, I think, World War II going on. No, World War One. Something was happening. And he could sense that is happening. And he's like, you'll get a call. I think they're trying to contact you. And they were. So, you know, you have a certain range. How you filter that, I have no idea. Okay. Um, because normally when you connect to the Kundalini of the Earth, it's all garbage that comes in. Because it's, it's like, um, why are we talking about this? The point is, um, number one, you awaken certain latent, um, what they call siddhis, right, in, uh, in yoga, right? So you awaken certain um, senses within you. And number two, you upgrade the body and correspondingly, you upgrade the etheric centers. Or you can say you upgrade the etheric centers and obviously, correspondingly, you will upgrade the body. And that's uh, also there in the book by uh, Master Chua. Um, 
me share the screen. So here it's talking about the quality of the brain um, and the nervous system depends, okay, with the next page. So the evolution of uh, the body is important so that it can also withstand greater amounts of spiritual and Kundalini energies flowing through the body. Now you have to understand the, the, the meaning of this, um, uh, the, the depth of this meaning um, of this statement, because when they're talking about only astral to etheric, if that is not possible, forget about mental to etheric and spiritual to etheric, all of that is not possible. That's why the Kundalini, what they're trying to say is needed by the brain cells in order to register high, high experiences. You see higher experiences, the frequency is too high. The brain cells is not capable of registering it. You see, you have, uh, you have certain senses, they have certain range, all right? Uh, the spiritual frequency is too high a range. All right, you're, since birth, you've been developing five senses, not spiritual sense. Okay, so that's why it's like you're driving. You remember in the old days when you had the radio and you do have it now, but you, you drive out of the city, it starts to become static. You can't hear it properly. Initially, it goes on and off and then it goes completely because the range of your receiver and also of the transmitter uh, have to be increased. In this case, the problem is not necessarily the transmitter. The problem is the receiver also. Okay, so uh, that's why sometimes in your meditation, somehow you felt like your bo body just woke up suddenly and it's finished the meditation or you're suddenly saying, uh, it, did I sleep? But you're sure you didn't sleep, but you went somewhere, but you don't know anything. You're, it's like your brain went blank. blank. It's like complete blank. Um, it's like you have a recording device uh, and suddenly the pitch is so high, it doesn't register on the tape anymore. Okay, so that tape is your brain. <laughs> All right. So when your spiritual experience is very high, your brain may not be able to, uh, to register. To and to improve the quality of your brain, you need Kundalini energy. It's like if you have VLC media player, sometimes you, are play, you want to play a movie or you want to play something and you can hear only the audio. There's no video. It's all black. And then it says, please download the codec for this or something like that. Uh, of, of course, downloading the codec in your brain is not as easy. You have to awaken Kundalini energy to get the codec. Yeah, it doesn't take 10 minutes yeah. or less. <laughs> right? <laughs> Something like 10 years. Yeah. So that, that's basically it. I think, um, okay, that's many methods. We'll go into that after this. All right. So well, one of the things also when you look at, uh, when you are in the astral body, uh, that happens during your meditation, it happens during your sleep time. And so one, yes, the ability to register. But also remember in the astral body, uh, if you have awakened to a large extent, uh, the Kundalini all the way up, your ability to even move in the astral world is amazing. So Master Joe says, for example, you can move from one point to another just like that. So, you know, for me, all these superheroes, uh, for example, Flash is basically got to do with the astral world. I mean, he's able to move from here to there. Uh, if you talk about uh, Superman and he's, he has this ability to fly, you can fly in the inner world. Uh, so all these characters that, that I look at in, uh, especially with Marvel and Avengers and whatever. So, they look like characters literally for me from there because everything that they can do is something that you and I can do every night. You can go there and you can become super powerful. You want to look super thin, I mean, muscular, Hulk, <laughs> whatever, you can, right? Uh, you want to protect yourself, you can. You can do anything, whatever you want. So if you want Good to- Good thing other people don't remember it in the inner world, Correct, right? Their true. brain is not <laughs> so it's like, and what were you doing yesterday? Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, their memory is not so You came good. dressed like Barbie? <laughs> Yeah. Who has Barbie's body? <laughs> I just wanted to try it. <laughs> yeah, you can do anything, right? <laughs> you can create anything that you want, whether it's a building, whether it's a piece of art, a piece of music, anything out there, and it comes out really amazing. Problem is for you to register it and come back to the physical world and then recreate it. That's that's the difficulty for most of us. Yeah. I think we should uh, take right. the questions. We'll just take your questions and uh, end for now. Otherwise, we won't be able to go ahead uh, with... Uh, now, with reference to Rahul, with reference to exercises, uh, chants, mantras uh, for awakening the Kundalini, since you're already talking about the breathing technique there, which is under Arhatic, just follow what we give in Arhatic, right? Uh, so you need to have preparations, which we will come to later. The yes. purification is very, very important before you try to awaken a Kundalini in any method. 
Now the Kundalini, there could be a special meditation only for Kundalini, but even when you do something as simple as the twin hearts, uh, even that meditation actually helps awaken your Kundalini. So even if you never do Arhatic Yoga and you sit and do only twin hearts every day, right, for example, your Kundalini will still get awakened because the process is different. Yeah, that's why it's called same. peace and illumination. illumination. So the peace technique is when you're doing the heart, the crown, the heart and crown, for those of you who've done it. Yeah. The illumination part is the point of light and the Om. Correct. Yes. And the let go. Right. And so those are very important. So if you can follow uh, the instructions or the steps, that's good enough for you to stay safe and uh, not to have any problems. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you want to answer this one? What is that? In case of disc bulge, is it a, a side effect of improper Kundini awakening <laughs> or is it the once past that time? I have no idea. It could be due to a physical uh, problem, an accident. I don't know. That I, could be definitely past it could karma. Be, of course. Definitely. It, of course, it could be. I mean, but it's just a bulge, is just a herniation of the disc, right? Just heal it. It's very, if you've done advanced pranic healing, it's actually a really good protocol to use. Um, when I used to start off, it was my favorite because it's almost very, very quick. Um, Lehrji was the employee of a British guy in the railways. Ah, yes, I got the story. And he was very worried about his Thanks wife was in Britain. Lehrji, I showed him that his wife is fine. Ah, so it was fine. I, I thought it was not fine. I just remember the essence. You know, the essence was he could detect the whole thing. So she'll be visiting him next month itself. And then his wife actually came the next month and she recognized Lehrji and told him that he already visited her and told her that she's fine. Oh. <laughs> ah, she was, her body was sick, I think, maybe. I don't um, I, I think Master Chua also did something similar uh, several times. One of the things that Master Nona would talk about is uh, she used to also travel to Cuba to teach. And uh, strangely, one day when she was in Canada, before she was traveling, he says, I want you to pick up this ticket. And uh, he says, just pick it up. And she says, Master, why are you asking me to pick up a ticket almost one year later? And uh, it so happened that when she was in Cuba, when she had to leave the country, suddenly there was trouble because uh, her return ticket, there was some issue with her return ticket. And uh, luckily her name was Castro, uh, which, which uh, worked in her favor. Because it's the <laughs> dictator's last name. Dictator's so last they always worried, like, are you Fidel's? <laughs> Correct. And, and, and so um, she was actually in trouble and she was doing the great invocation and she was invoking to master. And then the voice came, he says, look into your bag. Which she and ignored for a second. Yes. She, she was like, what is this? And then I think the voice came again, say, look into your bag. And then she looked into her bag and she found that ticket. And that was her ticket out of Cuba, which, which was uh, basically what saved her life, she says. And she says, Master knew this more than one year ago. This so, has to do with the Akashic records correct. connected and, to the Kundalini. And, and so the thing is, the sense of someone that evolved is not just with, you know, what you and I are supposed to do and, uh, but also taking care of his people and uh, knowing what's happening in their lives, right? And so even if you don't talk to Master, he actually knows a lot more about what's going to happen in our lives than we do. And he has given a lot of hints uh, at, at various points as to what you need to do or what you need to work on. Something that I uh, um, just wanted to share. Okay, so movie Inception. Batman. No, uh, we are like Batman, yeah. Uh, movie Inception. Inception is not really that. Inception is more like psychic cell defense, implanting of thought forms. <laughs> right? No, but the movement of the buildings. And ah, yeah, 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 maybe, maybe. You can do all that, yes. There's no gravity there. So you can do all those crazy things. I have no idea. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, yeah. Last session is there. Sapna, you can you look at it. Missed the recording this one, is there. this uh, dream. Golden standing in the bowl. Uh, huge water bowl with white and purple lilies and seeing the feet of someone huge okay. that's just the teacher because when master would explain sometimes the aura is so bright bright that you can't see anything uh but the grossest part which is just the feet because the rest is so bright you can't see it you can't see so there are some people uh disciples they paint the teacher and they just draw the feet <laughs> so master was like is this your teacher He's like yes like, but where's the rest? <laughs> rest of it? So that's when Master Chua explained, okay, the rest of it must have been so bright that the person who was trying to paint could not see. Um, and then, what, go down? And there's someone no, that's, there. that's, that's it. That's yeah. it? There was some... No, I'm looking at the ones before. Okay. Gauri, you asked about Claire audience and Claire, other stuff, Claire's. 
uh, they are uh, in the chapter nine, I think I spoke about it. Was it, is it uploaded yet? Um, it's there, but I think Vijay is still finding um, new means of which he could. I spoke about in chapter, uh, when we were talking about the Agnya and the throat, uh, because that they said, uh, that I didn't know, I had not read, I forgot that it's there. So um, I thought clear audience and that all was there, clairvoyance. So we just spoke about that that time. Uh, Kala's asking, thou anointed my head with oil, uh, my mm -hmm. cup runneth over. Is it the Kundalini energy? Isn't this in a movie? Anyway, it's but it's, I know I can see yeah, that, but I've heard it in a movie. Anyway, you can answer that. No, no, you can go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My uh, answer might be, go ahead. Finish it. Okay, the, the cup that we're referring to, um, there could be different interpretations. So I'll just give you one of the interpretations. Um, it's It's got to do with, is it okay? To no, say that? they don't they're not specified which part of the head was anointed there's a lot of traffic of chakras there in that region there's this one there's this one there's this one there's this one and all of them could mean different things okay so normally the anointment is done on the forehead okay i, I did not know that because i, I like in that uh, in the crown it's normally done yeah. oh it's done like that yeah you can talk about it but it's not the, it's not the crown then so it could be one of the chakras through which uh, the divine energy can then pour through into the body, right? So it could be the Agni chakra. That is one of the entry points also for divine energy. It could be even the forehead chakra, which is a different way of trying to spread. Uh, remember, the nervous system is also in every part of your body. So it could be these cups. So the chakras uh, are not just like this. They are like this. Especially when there's a, a higher energy coming in, they take a shape. They, they, the, they the, literally move. They, they turn upwards. They turn upwards so, like that. So like that or like that. So. And so they can hold. It's like a sunflower looking towards the sun, right? Yeah. So, it's, uh, so, so then it can hold a lot more energy and then allow it through the stem to spread to other parts of the body. And usually it's with chakras that have this uh, ability to spread to the rest of the body. Yeah. So I presume that's it's one. Divine energy, not Kundalini. That's only one level of truth. There are many others. Yeah. Uh, it, it's divine energy. I don't think it's Kundalini energy. Okay, Bhagya, you wanted to ask a question. Okay. You are just asking to unmute if you don't want. To, yeah. Okay. Hi. Atma Namaste, both of you. Uh, sometimes someone sees that it's a, a kind of insight. If the person sees uh, some accident and that accident really takes place in a couple of days, does it relate to some Kundalini energy? Uh, no, it relates to that energy manifest first in the uh, energy form before physicalizing. <laughs> you know, in pranic but uh, uh, the the ailment manifests. So life is like that. Sometimes you have dreams. Have you noticed that? And uh, you have dreams, and a few days later, it happens. You're like, what? Uh, that is the reason is because um, whatever happens, even as above, so below. So whatever happens, even in the physical world, uh, has to manifest energetically first. This is one of the principles of Kriya Shakti, also, right? So, Kriya Shakti, you're manipulating um, uh, the matter to physicalize what you want, the thought form. But sometimes you see the thought form, you're aware of it, and then it physicalizes, um, you know, and, and, and you see it, and then it happens. But it takes a few days for it to happen, or sometimes it could take some time, depending on the event and how big it is. Hardly a few hours. Yeah, so that, that happens sometimes. Now, that is one. But to see that, and for it to register in your brain, requires mm -hmm. Kundalini energy. <laughs> Do you understand? Oh, oh, so, okay. Yes. To upgrade the equipment to, to be able to uh, see that and then register it, that requires Kundalini energy. Uh, number two, it could be the other person's thought form. Okay? Okay. It could be okay. the other person's thought form. Uh, number three, it could just be uh, because sometimes the thought form is so strong that it will manifest. <laughs> Not that. Okay. You know? um, so, yeah. But uh, it's, very hard, which is very, it's very difficult to, if someone sees an accident, and just uh, I think just be electric violet light and disintegrate. Don't get involved because if you get involved, you will energize it. Yeah, you give it more energy. And, and remember, some but you might if the person is from our family, yeah, we can put it uh, put him in a protection. 
You cannot go above the will of God, but you can. That's what you do by just just erase the thought form. Why do you want to protect and keep the thought form? Okay, there? fine. Okay, we just have to erase that thought form. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes okay. in the astral world, there is in the astral world there is no time like you and I know as twenty four hours, right? So in okay. the astral world, sometimes you do see things that are going to happen, right? And so mm. it might register and it might probably happen. But remember, the future is dynamic. Yeah, you can always change. Yes. yes. So, uh, thank you. One time, Master Chua, you can mute. Uh, one time, Master Chua was with his uh, organizer, I think in China, I forgot where, and um, suddenly. He saw this image of him uh, crashing into a, a, getting into a big accident. And he was shocked. He's like, ah, I, why am I imagining this guy? And he tried to push away the thought form. And the more he pushed, the worse it became. The bigger it became. So he tried to push because he's, he was horrified by what he was thinking about. Uh, then he realized, then after some time, uh, this is actually an event that already happened. So at that time, uh, the, I think, if I remember correctly, I might be mistaken, the organizer like, you know, Master Joy, six months ago, I got into a really big car crash and it's really affected me. I've been thinking about it over and over. So, so that could be it. Sometimes it could be a thought form of someone else in your aura where they want you to, you know, like go, you know, fly a kite <laughs> and then float with it <laughs> or something like that. But you know what I'm saying? I don't want to verbalize it. Sometimes when they don't like you, you read it and it doesn't feel And good. then you sense it. When somebody comes to you, you sense it. You think it's yours. It's not yours. It's from them. Okay. So you just right. erase it. The bottom line is don't react, just erase it. Uh, Rahul, your question about your friend's uh, father's burning uh, sensation, we'll come to that uh, in the next session. We, we'll be talking something about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Gauri, um, with reference to your question, you're talking about uh, if it's not in the astral world, is it got to do with moving of the uh, moving in the physical world? Uh, I still didn't get your question. Do you want to unmute and tell me what that is? One sec. If you could just raise your hands, I can get to you faster. Golden statue could be Buddha. No, don't, don't. That is just a golden body. It could okay. be any yeah, highly. Yeah, now it's got Sorry, energy. go ahead, Gauri. Yeah. yeah, so I was just asking that uh, we, are, we are, like, you know, you were just explaining that in the astral world what happens and then when we wake up, we don't remember. But what about when we are awake and we are going about our normal affairs and then uh, we send something. So something similar to what uh, the previous question was that when we have an intuition that this is going to happen and then we, within a few hours, it actually happens. So uh, what would that be? I mean, uh, you are getting an intuition and it is happening. So uh, of course we bless the situation and we hope it doesn't happen, but uh, it's happening and you, you are sometimes, um, I mean, it happens a couple of times. So you know that it's not that you're imagining it or something. So how do we channelize that? I mean, I would think that if, uh, if you get an intuition, it would be nice if we could help people and tell them that, you know, just be careful or something. But, uh, if they listen to you. That, that's why, Gauri, you have to be careful what you wish for because everyone wishes for things and then when they see it, they're like, but I need to do something about it. But, but yeah, I mean, I just think you need to do something about it and uh, just... Life is life, so you can't do anything about it. But what you can do is you can invoke for love and mercy. These are two things that you invoke for. When you say love and mercy, it's part of uh, what we have in the Ahatic Invocation. If you notice the invocation goes divine light, divine love, divine power. Then again, yeah. he says love and mercy. That love and mercy is to show uh, love and mercy because we are children of God. So they love and through love, you have mercy. So if you invoke for love and mercy, there's actually a longer explanation, but we are out of time. Um, that, 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 should, that should do something if possible. Um, yeah, I, I usually invoke to... Um, to God and you know like then you I want to just say that I I wish I can only see with something that I can help rather than see whatever. No, don't I wish don't anything like that. that. Leave it to the higher beings. They know what to do. I yeah. don't want to see ghosts around and stuff. I want to just be careful no, no. that it's something La useful. Like attracts like so don't worry about that. Uh, but you know I don't want to get into ghosts because you know just yeah. bless them. If you start helping them there's like a full-time job. Yeah. Because it's not like patients that go to sleep. These guys don't sleep. They go uh, <laughs> okay. so don't get involved. I would not get involved in that type of, you see, everyone has a specialization. That type of specialization is really full-time work. <laughs> if you think pranic healing is full-time work, this will be, yeah. Okay. Even right. when you're in the toilet, they'll come. Okay, people. So let's end the session and sorry. Nothing. Uh, where, you can bring your questions next week. We'll continue with Kundalini. 
on Monday. Yeah. Please join Masudani session uh, tomorrow. Enjoy it. Oh, it's, it's about Kundalini. It's about Kundalini. So you can ask him many questions. <laughs> All right, shall we? Inhale and exhale, relax the body. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chua Hoksu, to Lord Maha Guruji Nyingen, to all the great ones, to all the teachers, masters of theosophy, of knowledge, light, and power, of communication, to our soul and divine self, we thank you for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your tremendous patience with us. Thank you for helping us with greater clarity and understanding of these priceless teachings. We especially ask for your light, for your love, for your mercy at all times. We especially ask for your healing energy all throughout the region of Delhi. We ask that Mother Earth be blessed with greater love, with greater peace, with greater healing energy. May she be blessed. May she be healed on all levels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With gratitude, with deep respect to you. Thank you. Atma Namaste, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, see you at Masadani's session and uh, for the rest of you, Monday. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye. Uh, link, please. Link was given to you by um, Aditya earlier, I think. No, no, no Vijay. For, for Masadani's. For Masadani's session. Oh, sorry. No, Masadani's session. Can somebody just put up the link? Yeah, it's there. Indra put it. Okay, thanks, Indra. Thanks for putting it up. Yeah. So, See, guys. those of you who want, uh, you can still register for uh, the session. It should be interesting and fun. Bye. Take care. Enjoy your evening. Sayonara. <laughs>